Uh, hello, everyone. I'm uh, John Chiaffi. I've been associated here with Stanford since 1978 as a student, alumni, or a faculty. Uh, one of the things over the years that's been probably the best part about being faculty uh, at Stanford, I'm emeritus now, but I had about 85, 90 stu PhD students, and advising them was the best part uh, of the job. And every one of them is unique uh, in a different way, so you get to learn them and try to help them and, and work with them. And uh, Dr. Acha Like, which, who is going to be our next uh, speaker here, um, uh, came to us from Georgia Tech, where he was the first black valedictorian of Georgia Tech, but that's not what makes him unique. I remember, he, he may have forgotten this one time, he's in my office, I was exploring with him, his plans and other things, and he mentioned that he had had dinner the previous night with the Reverend Jesse Jackson. And I said, well, you know, that, that, that's great. How did, how did you get to, to, to meet him? But he went into his political interests and other things. And this is really what distinguishes him. He's quite a business leader. And I used to tease him and say, you're going to go back to Africa at some point after you stayed here for a while. And you're going to become a very powerful and influential man uh, there. And if you do, I'm going to come visit you. And, and you're going to pick me up in a limousine and take me somewhere or whatever. So I was half right. I haven't visited him yet in Africa. But he has become a very influential man in Africa. He started the African Leadership Academy, which is a humanitarian group, uh, helps uh, young uh, people rise in, uh, into positions of power. But today, he is the chairman for the McKinsey Group for the entire continent of Africa. He's involved in many, many projects to try to build that continent. Uh, he has been named at least four times in the last decade to one of the most 100 influential people on the continent of Africa. He's going to speak today. He just gave me a copy of his book, African Business Revolution, uh, Evolution. And uh, he's going to tell you about his experiences in that area. I think you'll enjoy he hearing from the Electrical Engineering Department. Is very, very proud to have you as one of our alumni. Uh, Acha. Thank you. Thank you, John. It's, uh, it's great to be here. It's great to be back on, on campus. Uh, it is far <laughs> from South Africa, where I live. But it, it's great to be here. And I, I was saying, you know, I actually do feel like an imposter, because for everything John said, I'm like, you know, I did not continue doing, you know, more intricate research along the lines of what Prof. Hennessy was talking about. I, I didn't understand half of the talk, actually. <laughs> um, I did not start a billion dollar startup company. I have no patents in my name. Um, but what I tried to do when I left here is actually go back home and, and, and make a difference. And, and it started by, uh, at the time when we were doing research, thinking through, do I want to teach? Do I want to go back into, in, to go into industry? And I realized I actually was more interested in the business side of things. So I said, look, let me try to go learn about business to complement the engineering skills I'd learned. And, you know, but I didn't want to spend a couple hundred thousand dollars to uh, go to business school. So I thought, how best to do it? And then came McKinsey and they said, look, we'll pay you to teach about business, which I thought was great. <laughs> uh, so I joined McKinsey. The idea was to join for two years, um, based out of Atlanta, and then come back to the Valley uh, in a startup. But it's been 20 years and I'm still there. And along the way, I was doing work uh, in the US, but I also started doing some work on the continent and got really excited about the work I was doing there. I realized I was, I enjoyed what I did in the US, but I was much more passionate about helping clients uh, in Africa. And so I decided I'll move for a year uh, to South Africa, which is the only office we had at the time, and that was 17 years ago. Um, and so when I thought about, you know, what can I tell you about or talk about, there's only one thing I know, it's Africa. <laughs> And so I thought, uh, let me share what I know about Africa, but also what's happening on the continent, because I think regardless of what field you're in, whether you're an academic, whether you're a researcher, whether you're in public sector, whether you're in the private sector, um, you cannot ignore the continent. You cannot ignore the continent. Before we start, I'd love to understand how many people here have been to Africa? Okay, I don't know, about a quarter. Hopefully after this, this talk, uh, uh, we'll try to change that. Um, so let's start, and it'll be quite an interactive talk, hopefully. So, you know, I just wanted to start with some context about, about the continent. Welcome back to Who Wants to Be a Volunteer, the show that's putting you on the front lines. I'm here with Lily, who's all the way from Europe, and she's one question away from winning the grand prize, a chance to save Africa. For the grand prize of a chance to save Africa, answer this question. How many countries are there in Africa? Is it A, one, B, two, C, five, or D, 54? Um, A, 
one. Final answer. Uh, yes. Well, Lee, looks like you're gonna have to pack your bags. But you're not going home. You're gonna go save Africa. <laughs> Wrong answer. <laughs> um, but, but, but can you actually blame her, right? Because you know, when they talk about Africa, they typically talk about Africa with its 1.2 billion people, the way they talk about India with 1.3, and the way they talk about China with 1.4 billion, right? Um, but the reality is the continent is much more, much more complex. And, and one of the reasons it is misunderstood um, is because when global media talks about the continent, they tend to talk about three things. They tend to talk about conflict, crisis, and corruption. So we just took one, this is the New York Times. We could have taken any global media, and this was in 2017, and took over a one week period, we looked at every single article they wrote about the continent. And they wrote five articles. One was about the Boko Haram crisis in northern Nigeria. One was about um, the migrants trying to flee into Europe. Two were about corruption in Tunisia and Angola. And one was about conflict in the DRC. And I always say, look, these are important stories to tell, but on their own, they give a very biased perspective on the continent. And the numbers tell us something different. It tells us about a continent that has tripled in economic size. GDP is now over $2 trillion. It tells about a continent that has lifted 50 million people out of poverty during this period. Again, not enough, but it's a, it's a good start. It tells us about a continent where infant mortality has, has come down over 50% in that period and a continent that's more educated, right? Uh, uh, literacy rates are 65%, uh, youth literacy rates are 70%. There are over 10 countries that have literacy rates of over 90%, right? And again, there's even more to it. Let's listen some more. Any mention these days of what was once called the dark continent conjures up lazy images of war, famine, corruption, or disease. Who has time to mention the 22 Nobel laureates from nine different African countries, right? And guess where four of the 10 fastest growing economies in the world are located? Not in Europe. Yep, they're in Africa, which of course has issues with poverty and inequality. But let's not forget that one in three Africans is middle class and the continent is one of the fastest growing markets in the world for mobile phones. And guess which one of these two places is in Africa? Wrong. There you go. <laughs> That's what leapfrogging helps with. Um, so, um, but before we, we realize what we need to do and I do this presentation is we need to reset our mental model on Afri about, about Africa. So I'm now gonna ask you some questions, right? So the first question is how does Africa's mass compare to the US, China, India, Japan, and Europe? The size of the continent. Thank you very much, perfect, it's big. You can put them all and you still have some more space left. Second, of the 10 fastest growing economies in the world last year, how many were in Africa? You watched the video. That, that was 2017. <laughs> but good, good. So 2018 was? I hear four, five, it's actually six. Uh, the top two in the world, right? Ghana and Ethiopia are the two fastest growing economies in the world, four of the top five, and, uh, and six of the top 10. Uh, the World Bank publishes a report every year uh, called Ease of Doing Business, where they rank countries based on how, much, how many reforms they've done to improve the environment for, for, for the private sector. Of the top 10 reformers in the world last year, how many do you think, do you think were in Africa? Eight? Uh, I like people are being optimistic. Five, All right? So five, you know, again, Cote d'Ivoire, like you saw, was one of the fastest growing economy in the world, you know? So a lot of reforms going to really encourage the private sector to come and, and, and operate there. And then this is a question I always ask um, people, I've asked this probably to 5,000 people as I do these presentations. And if you've read the report of the book, do not answer, please. Um, the question is, how many companies do you think make a billion dollar of more revenue in Africa? Right? Whether it's a multinational company, whether it's a local company, a state-owned enterprise, how many companies do you think would make a billion dollar of more revenue on the continent? I hear 50. Are you 100? All right, I typically hear between 50 and 100. Uh, the answer is 438, right? And I mean, it took us three months to build this database and people are very surprised, but I always say, your perspective on Africa is very different. If you think 50 companies make a billion dollar, then if you know it's 450, 
right? And by the way, 40% of these companies are listed. And for the listed companies, we're able to compare their performance to their peers around the world. And we're able to show that uh, companies in Africa grow faster and are more profitable on a local currency basis than the peers. And that's why you see a lot of interest, at least on the private sector side uh, on the continent. Now, we don't just have amazing companies doing very well. We also have great talent, right? Um, I just thought I'll share the trends that are shaping the continent and hopefully uh, get you uh, to understand what's happening. And there are really five trends, and we call them the big, the big five. One is demographics, right? And on this page, obviously, you know, three words are important, young, fast growing, and urbanizing. So we are the youngest continent in the world. The average African is 20. Right? The average African is 20. So imagine getting a customer like that for life as a loyal customer. Uh, and I always give an anecdote. There are more babies born in Nigeria every year than in the whole of Western Europe. So if you're a baby foods company or you're a diapers company, where is your growth going to come from? Um, second is fast growing. Today, the 1.2 billion Africans out of about 7 billion in the world, one of every six uh, world citizen is African. Uh, by 2050, will be 2.5 billion, one out of every four. By the turn of the century, it will be 4 billion, one out of every three. Right? Again, there are a number of risks associated with that. By the way, let's, let's, let's recognize it. But again, huge opportunities right, uh, of the continent. And it's urbanizing. Right? We're the fastest urbanizing region in the world. Every year, 24 million Africans move from, from ur ur rural regions to the cities. And the urban African is two and a half times more productive than the rural African, right? So you put all that together. And as we were writing the book, we interviewed a bunch of leaders from around the world. And one of the ones we interviewed is Tijan Tiam. Tijan Tiam is from Côte d'Ivoire, and he's the CEO of Credit Suisse, the, the investment bank. And uh, he told us, and before that, he ran Prudential, an insurance company globally. And he said this reminded him of his, his experience when he ran Prudential and what he saw in China, where he said, once you have a, a growth in, 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 in GDP, combined with the growth in disposable income, what you get is an exponential growth in demand. Right? And that's what we're, we're, we're seeing across the continent. Uh, and that's reflected in the second theme, uh, second trend, which is more around, around the manufacturing, the industrialization of the continent. Now, a lot of that demand has to be fulfilled somehow, and more and more, more, more of it is fulfilled in Africa. Right? We used to import a lot, but there's a lot of focus on now uh, manufacturing our own. Again, we did a lot of work to understand how much we manufacture today on the continent. The reality is we manufacture about $500 billion worth of products. 70% are manufactured in country and consumed in the same country. About 10 to 12% are manufactured in country and exported across the rest of Africa. And 20% are manufactured in country, exported across the rest of the world. We as McKinsey project that we should be able to get that to a trillion dollars, right? Which would be tripling the, the growth rate of manufacturing. And there's a lot of focus uh, uh, across in our countries on that. So for example, in China, as you know, as wages rise, a lot of jobs, on the, at least on the labor intensive manufacturing are moving out of China, about 80 million jobs that are moving out of China. And increasingly, you're seeing them move to Africa, right? They're moving to Ethiopia, they're moving to Mauritius, to Madagascar. Uh, so we're seeing a lot more of that trend, so a lot more uh, focus from the private sector, from, from development partners, and from the government in manufacturing a lot more locally. Third trend is infrastructure, right? You cannot talk about uh, Africa without talking about infrastructure. Uh, again, here this is where we, we, you know, we really underperform relative to anywhere in the world across every single asset class, right? Whether it's power, right? You know, there's, there's still 600 million Africans with no access to electricity today, whether it's roads, rail, seaports. Um, uh, you know, but still, we're making progress, right? 15 years ago, we spent about $40 billion a year on infrastructure. Um, today, we're spending about $80 billion. Uh, it's still far from the $150 billion we need to spend, but we're getting there. And leveraging technology, which I'll come back to, to really close this gap. Uh, and again, the governments, the World Bank, uh, the African Development Bank, a lot of players uh, are focused on it. Actually, on Monday, before I came here, we had a summit called the Africa Investment Summit, uh, where we bring together uh, investors and projects and really try to do a matching, and that's funded by the African Development Bank to really help close some of these infrastructure gaps. So a lot of focus going in uh, on the infrastructure space. Fourth is resources, right? Africa is known for its resources. If you look at agriculture, we have 60% um, uh, of the unused arable land in the entire world is in Africa, right? So enough land to feed the continent and feed the world. Again, a lot of uh, issues we've had there around yields uh, of, of our farmers, right? But again, a lot of work is going in to raise those yields and raise farmer incomes, by the way, that way as well, and feed Africa and feed the rest of the world. You turn to mining, and you know, we have the number one reserves across a bunch of commodities, gold, cobalt, manganese, diamond, uh, and, and, and so on, right? Platinum, 
right, and uh, phosphate, right, you just named a lot of the number one reserves. And then you look at oil and gas, right, again, you know, some of the biggest reserves, you know, the gas fields in Mozambique can, can, can power can enough gas to supply to, for 20 years to Italy, Germany, France, and the UK combined, right. So again, a lot of resources. The challenge we've had is actually using those resources to benefit our people. And more and more now, we're seeing governments who are focusing on making that happen under a lot of pressure from the IMF and other players like that. And then the final trend is, of course, technology, right, which you, which you know well. Um, it's completely transforming the way we live on the continent. It started with the mobile phones, right? We can completely fix, uh, skip uh, fixed lines. We basically had uh, very few. We had, we had more, there were more fixed lines in Manhattan than in the whole of Africa. And then through mobile, you know, it completely leapfrogged. We have 700 million mobile phone users in Africa today, 40% are on smartphones, and that's growing very fast. But what technology has done is started to transform sector by sector. So the next sector, it's transformed transform the financial services sector, right? So again, uh, Africans didn't have access to bank accounts, didn't have access to credit products, saving products. And instead of building branches, now we've you know, it's reaching technology. So if you look at the mobile money accounts in the world, of all the mobile money accounts in the world, 60% are in Africa, right? Um, so it's, it's transforming financial services, it's trans then it's transforming a number of other sector. Um, uh, energy, for example, right? The power sector with solar, solar home systems that uh, provide now uh, energy to, to, to homes in most remote places and they pay by mobile payments, pay a dollar a day, and that's how you start to get access to energy. And they've connected over a million households across East and West Africa in a, in a, very, in a very short period of time. It's transforming the public sector, right? It's making actually elections uh, more fair and credible, right? Uh, because it's harder, it's harder to rig elections. It's transforming a number of sectors. We predict, as McKinsey, we project that if we use technology to its fullest, the impact on Africa will be about $300 billion, which is roughly the size of South Africa, which is a big economy, right? So it's hugely important. One particular sector that is, that is transforming, and that's some work I've been doing outside of McKinsey with some friends, is the education sector, right? So. We, are, uh, we started by building a high school, uh, like John mentioned, called the African Leadership Academy. And again, leveraging technology to help transform the continent, right? So we realized that um, regardless of what we say about Africa, it's a failure of leadership that's really at, at the root cause of, of, of the issues we have. But in Africa, we, we, our institutions are not that strong, and so what happens is you have a good, the, the difference between a good and a bad leader is, is a massive difference, right? A good leader can really transform the country. A bad leader can take you back 30 years. And we always say that the emergence of good leaders is too important. The, the future of Africa is too important to leave the emergence of good leaders to chance. So what we did is let's actually set up a school that's going to train these leaders. So it's a high school. It's the last years of high school. We then place the students around the world, uh, universities around the world. Actually, you have one here. I think it's Gift here. There you go. There's Gift. Gift is actually he's doing a PhD here in electrical engineering. He went to ALA. Um, and, uh, and we, you know, we place them around the world, but they have to come back to Africa to make a difference. That's the argument we have with them. And uh, we've done, we've been going for, for 10 years now, and uh, what we realize is 80% of the students ended up at university in the US, right? Because most of them couldn't afford, actually ALA is in need blind admission as well, so we figure out how much you can pay, and we complement the rest. Uh, it's a boarding school in South Africa. And so we said, why can't we build universities, the equivalent of the, of the Ivy Leagues, the equivalent of Stanford's in, in Africa? And now we started building universities called African Leadership University, ALU. Um, and uh, again, very technology-based, very pure learning. You know, we, it's the cost, uh, it costs one twentieth of the cost to come to Stanford. Um, and we're providing, you know, really good education, right? We provide really good education. And um, we have a campus in Mauritius, we have a campus in, uh, in Rwanda, and now we're building, we're building, we're building one in Kenya, actually. Uh, Fast Company has a list of, um, they put out a list of the 50 most innovative companies in the world every year, and ALU was number 39 on that list this year, and it was the only university on that list, actually, by the way. Um, um, so, so, again, using technology to really transform, help make a difference on the continent is, uh, is part of what, 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 what I've been focusing on quite a bit. And if all of this doesn't convince you about why you should come to Africa, let me try something else, which is just how magical, how magical the continent is, right? So from you know, Big Falls, which is one of the seven wonders of the world. If you haven't seen it, it's beautiful. To the Serengeti, you can see you know, all the wildlife you can imagine um, across the continent. Mount Kilimanjaro is the tallest mountain, uh, tallest peak in Africa at 5,600, 900 meters. Cape Town, one of the most beautiful cities in the world. I encourage you to visit. The Nile, which is the longest river in the world, goes across 11 countries. 
the desert, the Sahara Desert in North Africa. So again, a lot, a lot to do and a lot to see. And I'll just end there and hopefully, you know, through some of these slides, explain to you a bit what's happening on the continent and why I think regardless of, of the space you're in and you play in, why you cannot afford, afford not to, to look at the continent. And, uh, and for me, actually, just to thank Stanford, I think, you know, I spent five years here, it was a great time, and it also allowed me to reflect. And this is where, while I was here, I really realized my purpose in life. And I always say, at the end of the day, um, there's one question that guides my life, and every day I wake up and I really think about the question. And that question is, would it have mattered to Africa that I lived? Would it have mattered to Africa that I lived? Thank you very much. Uh, is there much oil in Africa? <laughs> if there's not, maybe that's a good thing. <laughs> the, the problem is there is, <laughs> which is a bad thing. So it's funny because you look at, you know, the countries that have oil are probably the ones that are doing the worst, right? And I remember we were with the president of Senegal, um, and they discovered oil in Senegal about seven years ago. I remember we had a meeting with him, and he was actually, on one hand, he was happy they discovered, on the other hand, he was actually quite unhappy, because he said, you know, there's a risk of what this could do in the country has, has been on a, on, a great, on a great positive trajectory. And he understood the risks, right? So, so part of the challenge we have is natural resources. We drop everything to really go on and, and, and focus on these resources. And they create a lot of revenue, a lot of drive, but they don't create many jobs. And then they create a, a bunch of perverse incentives as well. Yeah, a question, a question here, this side. Yes. Yeah, is there any uh, EU-like treaty going on or planned in Africa? And the second one, what is the common science and teaching language among African countries? Yeah. So on the first one, absolutely, there's the Africa Union, which is sort of the EU for Africa. Um, it's more of a political union, and we've been uh, going through a process of actually reforming it. I'm part of a committee that's helping to reform the AU now. Uh, what we're trying to do is create more of an economic union, right? So you have a number of regional economic communities, one for West Africa, one for East Africa, one for Southern. Uh, but we just signed, countries just signed last year actually, the Africa Continental Free Trade Agreement, which is bringing together the entire continent. Because what we have is too many small countries, right? And we need to have one economic unit, right? You know, to then be the interface with a China, with an India, with the US. And so countries have now come together and they signed this, and now it's, it's getting put into, into action. Then on the second question, language, I mean, you know, the, the four big ones, right, English, French, Portuguese, and Arabic, right, so it really depends on the country, but in terms of business, generally business is done across most of the continent in English. Yes. Uh, yeah. um, I wonder what your view is of how Africa, the many countries there, could essentially electrify their energy system. So when you look at South Africa, it acts just like PG&E in California. It turns off the power pretty much a few hours every day. And that's a very rich country. So what are we going to do in the rest of the uh, continent? I mean, there's a lot, there's a lot. That's a, that's a big question, right? There's a lot going, like I said, the 600 million Africans that don't have access to electricity today. Um, a lot of focus on that. Um, so generation is a big part, right? But also just transmission. Part of the issue we had is, for a government to, to provide energy to most, some of these most remote, remote places, just, it just wasn't cost effective at all, right? So then it had to subsidize it and then there were resource constraints. So I think technology is helping a lot, making sure it's a big focus, right? So when President Obama was, uh, was in power, he launched something called Power Africa, where the goal is actually to provide, you know, 10,000 megawatts of power to the continent. And they're on track, actually, to, to, to deliver that, working with the private sector. So there's a huge focus on, uh, on doing it. Part of it is financing. Right? But honestly, you know, the money is there, right? You know, it's a big, it's a big money. But actually, it's about execution. How do you actually get these things executed, right? Um, but again, I'll say, you know, we're making progress, um, but, but we have a long way to go. All right. Oh, sorry. One more question. Your, your statistics didn't cover, didn't cover academic, academic institutions and number yes. of graduates. And how, what is the status of that? Yeah, I mean, we, yeah, I didn't spend much time on education. Um, a long way to go. I mean, you know, primary education, we're getting there, right, in terms of, of universal, but, you know, we're, we're still not there. Um, uh, on tertiary education, you know, we are far from it, right? There's a huge drop-off between secondary and tertiary. And, and you know, part of what we realize is if, um, uh, if you look at sort of the tertiary penetration in India compared to Africa, to just meet the India levels, we need to build 50 schools the size of Stanford every year for 20 years, right? It's not going to happen. 
right? And that's why we have to think about very, very different models, very innovative models to actually do that, right? Um, a, a big push has to be on vocational training as well. It doesn't have to be, you know, these big scale universities. We think about 8% 8, 8 of the workforce actually goes into vocational training. We think it should be 50%. Right, and so a lot of big pushes to say, you know, how do you, how do you do that? Um, and then the, the then the final thing is the issue is that even when you have jobs. I mean, another statistics for you: the 50 million Africans who graduate from high school every year, the university slots for only six million. Right, so that's just places. That's not even quality. Right, and so the question is, how do you then not just not just help them get an education, but actually connect them to jobs? Right, because a lot of people get a you know finish they finish a university and they still don't have jobs, right? So it's 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 quite an intricate, complex system that all needs to come in place. But you know, people are working on different pieces of it. All right. Well, I'll be here for at least for lunch, and then I have to head back to Africa. So, thank you. Thank you.